to her what a what a wonderful, helpful lady she was, and how pleasant it was to talk with her. And the uh, Lord just constantly poking me the kind of the whole time of is that how people feel when they listen to you talk for a while and you're trying to help them? And, and I think, well, Lord, sometimes maybe I'm not as uh, as pleasant or as helpful to them as that lady was to me. And uh, I'm dealing with eternal things. And she's just dealing with some things that if that don't work out, I'll get something else. Uh, we need to, to, to look at our our lives, our work, our, our conversation and fellowship with the Lord as having the eternal uh, presence and value that it really does. Because sometimes we just dismiss it as, oh, it's just a witness, or it's just this, or it's just that. It's just as uh, uh, Brother Sean uh, quoted earlier, it's the sanctification of truth by the Word of God, because God's Word is truth. It's not only truth, it's the truth. It's not some of the truth. It is the truth that is available to mankind. And we ought to do our very best when we, uh, when we deal with that in any manner. Deuteronomy 28, verse 15. Again, Deuteronomy is that book that uh, is there standing on the other side of the Jordan looking across there. Uh, I, bet they, I bet they're like a kid looking at a brand new bicycle. Well, Moses, shut up and let me get on it. <laughs> let me get over there and get into it. But they can't go in until they get the last words that he's got to say to them about what God says about blessings and cursings, uh, about what God says about how to be on his right side or how to be on the wrong side of the living God. That ought to be words that you and I can, uh, can take to heart. The Bible says that the things that happen to them, that is Israel, were written unto us upon uh, for our, us upon whom the ends of the world have come. Uh, we stand down here at the end of the age, and what God did with Israel, the way that He uh, chastened them, the way He fought for them, and the way that He delivered them, are examples and lessons for you and I that uh, there are conditions on that level of blessings. Now, I want to say something here. The only condition of salvation is that you repent of your sin and trust Jesus Christ and Him alone to save you from your sin. But if you want the blessings God has that, that come in this life, there are conditions placed on that life uh, that our, our walk would be pleasing to Him, that our daily life would be something that God could look down on and say, well, we're laborers together and I'm going to bless what you're doing not God looking down from heaven and saying, you belong to me. What are you up to? Why am I having to chase you? Why do I have to pr push you and constantly provoke you to do something for me? You ought to be excited about living for me. So let's see what he says about Israel here down in verse 15. Uh, let me start in verse 13. And this is the encouragement. You know, there's always a little bit of sugar on the end of the stick that uh, is used to, to get people to do something. And he uh, God says through Moses, and the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail, and thou shalt be above, uh, shalt be above only, and thou shalt, shalt not be beneath, if, remember he talks about that, all the ifs in the beginning of this chapter, I think there's four of them in 15 verses, if that thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and to do them. You know, I know what those people could have said, they could have said just like a lot of people do in church, well, that's just what the preacher said. People, I, I talk to them all the time, they say, well, our church believes this, and our church believes that. Well, I don't care what your church believes. What, what do you believe? Do you believe what the Bible says is the absolute Word of God, or do you believe you've got to filter that through your teacher's opinions, or for your pastor's opinions, through your own opinions? Uh, you know, uh, Brother Rex Harrison, he's quite a character, and he had a lot of those uh, backwoodsism. and he had one of them, he said, uh, opinions, uh, i never forget this, a very, very cultured, sophisticated fellow. He said, uh, opinions are like armpits. <laughs> Everybody has them, and they all stink. <laughs> uh, the next time you think about what your opinion means to God, it don't mean a thing to him. What God's concerned with, what does he have to say about it? You, uh, you take your armpits, you cover them up with something, make them smell better, and then keep them to yourself. So he says this in verse... Uh, Verse 14, and, and thou shalt not go aside from any of the words which I command thee this day to the right hand or to the left to go after other gods to serve them. You know what the problem is today? 
We don't have other gods, gods on the right hand or on the left hand. We make ourselves God. And we dictate our own doctrine. We dictate what we're going to believe. We dictate just how far we're going to go with God. The fact is, if you're saved, you've been bought with a price. You don't belong to yourself anymore. You're not your own. You belong to the Son of the living God. He paid His blood for you. You were thrilled to death when you first heard that. You were so excited when you heard He'd forgive you for all your sins. You were, you were just thrilled beyond words when you said, I love you, I'm going to take you to glory with me. I got a mansion with your name inscribed over the door and I got all the furniture custom suited to just you. And then he said, and I want you to go tell that person over there about me. And that's when the, the battle started. Well, what will they think of me? What, 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 what should I say? How should I do that? I, I don't really want to do that. I'm not ready yet. I'm not trained. God said, go tell them what happened to you. You do know what happened to you, don't you? That's all we got to know. We, we don't have to be geniuses. What we have to have is a heart and a concern for, for uh, first of all, for the Lord. Second of all, for our relationship with Him. And third of all, for everybody else. And if we can keep that order, man, we'll do well. Judgment seat of Christ will be a, be a shouting ground. And here's what verse 15 has there, because there's still ifs yet to be unwrapped. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Now, we talked about this before. It's one thing to hearken is to listen, give attention to. It's one thing to listen. It's something else to do it. Don't be dismissive of doing it. When you hear that, you're, you're bound. You're bound to it, whether you hear it or not. Because uh, I think we talked about this the other day. You know what the world depends on? Well, I didn't know. I didn't hear about that. I didn't understand that. I, I wasn't taught that. That ain't God's problem. See this book right here? If you can't find a good teacher... Open that book open. Start reading. You let the Holy Spirit teach you something. But you better get it. Because once you got saved, God says, that's what you're accountable for. That's the word right there that's going to clean you. That's the word going to fix you up. That's the word going to set you up. That's the word that's going to drive you and guide you and lead you and keep you. You better watch it. Because those ifs are in there for a reason. Just because you got saved don't mean Joyce Myers has a clue what she's talking about. That woman doesn't have a, 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 an imaginary word in her head for what that Bible says. She just makes stuff up and just spits it out there and the gullible suckers just lap that stuff up like a little uh, new little kitten at a bowl of milk. Well, I tell you what, they better start moving on to some stronger meat than that because you're going to need it when you stand before the Lord Jesus Christ to give an account of yourself in the day. And he says, well, what do you do for me? He's not going to ask you how you felt about yourself. How prosperous you were. Did you make a lot of money? He's going to ask you, what did you do for him? that will make a difference. But it shall come to pass, if, uh, <laughs> if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Uh, that, that phrase there, overtake thee, you know what that is? That's, that's a picture of something that's lurking on the side of the road, that's hiding out in the woods just in back of your house, that's in the back seat of your car, just waiting to jump on you and overtake you if something happens to give it a chance. And God says that chance is the if of you hear what's right, but you don't do it. You're deceiving yourself, thinking everything's going to be well. We went through uh, the last chapter there, chapter 27, from verse 15 down to 26. There's uh, 12 verses and there's 12 curses that cover pretty much everything you could imagine in your life, both as an Old Testament Jew or New Testament Christian, that God says he's going to curse if you don't do what he told you to do. So, well, I'm saved. I, I didn't say you're going to lose your salvation because every one of those curses deals with the physical here and now. And you know what? That's where we're living right here and now, isn't it? Now, if you want a good life, you want to live and prosper, just do what the Lord tells you to. He says, if you, uh, if you seek him first in the kingdom of God and his righteousness, he'll give you all of the things that you have need of. Quite frankly, in my life for the last 40 some years, he's given me way more than I need. 
man, I have been blessed more than I could even imagine. So he's not stingy. He's not trying to hold out on anybody. He's not trying to do anything. You know, he's trying to, trying to make you realize. Do what he wants you to do so that he can bless you. Don't do what he says don't do so he doesn't have to curse you. It's not complicated, folks. It's simple. Verse 16, let's see where all these curses fall. By the way, anybody remember a verse from the book of Proverbs? Uh, or Ecclesiastes, I guess. This is a, Jan, help me out here. The curse causeless shall not come. Is that the Proverbs? Yeah, as a bird by flying. So the curse causeless shall not come. God's not going to curse you if you didn't earn it. God's not going to curse you just because something somebody else did something in your life. You're going to get what you got coming. I, I was talking with somebody today, and we were, we were just laughing and joking about the people in the world that they think, boy, I can't wait till I get what's mine. Can't wait till I get what's coming to me. Uh, you know what? You might want to rethink that. I can't, I can't wait till I get more of the mercy that God gave me that I didn't deserve. More of that grace that I had no right to. That crowd that wants to get what they deserve, uh, boy, they'll, they'll, they'll live to regret that day. So he says in verse 16, Cursed shalt thou be in the city. Cursed shalt thou be in the field. Well, isn't that what we just read over in chapter 27? Yeah, I'm not sure it's word for word, but you know what? When God tells you something twice, you better listen, hadn't you? Yeah. 17. Cursed shall be thy basket and thy store. Your merchandising ain't going to work. You're going to try and sell something that ain't going to be bought. You're going to go try and uh, put something away for the winter, and it'll be like Haggai says, you, you, uh, you uh, try and rob God, you put something in your pocket, and uh, all of a sudden there's a hole in that bag. You know the expression, you got a hole in your pocket? That's, that's, a, that's a sort of a paraphrase from the book of Haggai. You got a bag with a hole in it. It's what a, what a pocket is. It's a bag sewed to the inside of your pants so you can put stuff in it. Uh, verse 18, Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body. Imagine this. God's going to curse your children because of what you do. Yeah, you know what? Solomon, wise man, wasn't he? Man, he wrote uh, what? songs and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and got, got filthy, stinking rich, built a glorious temple out of all the stuff that David had laid beside him, and his son Rehoboam comes on there and the kingdom falls apart before he could blink an eye. Say, well, but he's the son of a king. So are you. Well, he had all that wisdom. You got the truth of God. Ain't no more wisdom in this world than that. And what are we doing with it? Are we letting God use us? Are we are applying that wisdom, that divine knowledge, that uh, spiritual understanding to our life? Or are we just kind of, well, I'm saved. Uh, God must get tired of hearing that. And you might be thinking, well, I don't really say that. That's, God certainly understands what you mean, doesn't he? You know, you say, I'm going this far. What keeps you from going all the way? Well, yeah, I know. Cursed shall be, verse 18 again, cursed shall be the fruit of thy body and uh, the fruit of thy land. Your fields aren't going to do much. And the increase of thine kind, thy kind and the flocks of thy sheep. Your cows and your sheep ain't going to produce much. Well, what's God got to do with that? <laughs> Anybody remember Jacob and Laban? He's got everything to do with it. You prosper when God says you prosper. You fail when God says you fail. You can try and get around it. You can take out insurance policies, but you're going to fail when God says you fail. And God's not failing you because he don't care. God's failing you because you quit on him. Verse 19, Cursed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and cursed shalt thou be when thou goest out. Did you ever hear anybody talk about their comings and goings? If there's no blessing on those things, what do you do? 
Some people would sit there at the door and just lament, don't know what to do next. How about repentance? You know what's pathetic? This, this bunch of preachers coming up today, I, I hate to call them preachers, just heretics, crazy people. They say, well, you know, repentance isn't part of the gospel. Man, repentance better be part of your life. That Bible talks about, uh, uh, except ye repent, ye shall all and likewise perish. Uh, that Bible says that, uh, that uh, because of Jesus Christ dying on the cross, God has commanded all men everywhere to repent. Jesus said that he preached repentance towards God and faith towards Jesus Christ. How say these people that, uh, well, there's no repentance in the gospel. Man, you better wake up. Get that Bible open. Never mind what they say. You find somebody that says something as silly as that, you better run for your life from them. Cursed shalt thou be when thou comest in. Cursed shalt thou be when thou goest out. No relief, no nothing. Stand where you're at. Repent of your sin and walk away blessed. Verse 20. The Lord shall send upon thee. Boy, you know what? If you turned on preaching Sunday morning, you'd be hard pressed to find a preacher that'd tell you this. You know what they tell you? Jesus loves you. You watch that, that suck up fairy Joel Osteen. God just wants you to have your very best life. Your very best life with God is totally submitted to him, doing his will and counting it all glory when you're persecuted for righteousness sake. That guy wouldn't even know what that means. Look at what the Lord will do if you don't. The Lord shall send upon thee cursing, vexation. Anybody know what it is to be vexed? It's when something is so against you and you've got nothing you can do about it. You know, when they talked about Lot had vexed his, the, the, the men of Sodom, let, uh, vexed his righteous soul. Man, I don't know where Lot's righteous soul was. I'll take it for granted. God says it's there, so it's there. But every day he went out there and fought against that. You know what he, what he went out with, I guess? I shouldn't be in a wicked place like that. Abraham's out there. I bet he's doing well and having good fellowship with God. And I'm down here wrestling with these scummy sodomites and perverts and deviates and all this kind of stuff, watching my family go right to hell and right down the drain with them. But the money's here. You know, you got to do, yeah, man's got to make a living. You got to get along in this world. You got to do this. To... He, he found out what was right, but wouldn't do anything about it. He was vexed. But God says, I'll vex you. You know what you're going to do about it when God does it? Nothing. You're going to suffer till you get on your face and call on God to save you from even that. Vexation and rebuke. God's going to send on you rebuke in all that thou settest thine hand for to do. Going to school? You want to do right? God will set his hand against you. Want to get married? God will put his hand against it. Want to have a job? Make a living? God says, you're not doing what I want you to do. Don't look for my blessings on that. I'm going to be against you. Well, I thought, I thought God was for us. He is. All things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. What good is there in you disobeying God? See, God has a great interest in getting us right and allowing us to serve him rightly, correctly, joyfully. He gets no, no pleasure out of those things, but he does it for our benefit. Better stay on the right side of these things, folks. He says, uh, let me read all this, try and get all this together. Man, there's just so many interesting little uh, twists and turns, all these. Verse 20 again, the Lord shall send upon thee cursing, vexation, and rebuke in all that thou settest thine hand for to do until thou be destroyed and until thou perish quickly because of the wickedness of thy doings whereby thou hast forsaken me. That sounds pretty serious, doesn't it? God didn't want to do any of those things. God watched over him for 400 years. 30 years worked with him under Pharaoh. Another Pharaoh's come up. 
God was with Israel, saw them through all that stuff, took them 40 years through the wilderness, brought them up to this point. He says, there it is, guys. I brought you this far. I just want you to know everything that's out there in front of you, by the time your feet get uh, on the other side of that Jordan, you could be well on your way to losing it all before you even look around. You say, why? Get their heart set on the blessings rather than the blesser. Get their heart set on the things God's going to give them on the, rather than on the God that's going to give them the things. Over in, uh, in Revelation chapter 2, when Paul, uh, excuse me, when uh, John criticizes that Ephesian uh, church of Ephesus, he praises them to high heavens on everything they're doing except one little thing. And that one little thing threatened that entire church. He says, you've left your first love. You lose your first love in a marriage, you know what it is? It's just a cold relationship. It's just a, a, a stale kind of roommate kind of thing, maybe at best. Whereas before, couldn't wait to get home, couldn't wait to talk to each other, couldn't wait to see each other, couldn't wait to tell each other all the things that had happened, good, bad, and indifferent, knowing that there's a, there, there, there's a, a sympathetic ear, somebody who's taking your part. Boy, you lose that. What a picture that is. Don't, don't, don't lose that fellowship with the Lord. Don't let anything step between you and Him. Whereby thou hast forsaken me, He ends it. The wicked of your doings, whereby thou hast forsaken me. You know what? Israel never saw themselves as forsaking the Lord. All they thought is, well, we're getting a little bit more liberal. We're getting a little more updated. We're, we're, I mean, look at all these other countries around us. They can't all be wrong or we'll put a, we like what they do. We like the way they do it. And you see churches around the country being turned into nightclubs and coffee shops. And, and uh, they're still calling themselves a church. Some of them got Baptist on the door. But really what they've become is sort of an entertainment center for people who are spiritually a little bit numb but got enough going on to realize I need to be in church and that passes for church. Preacher steps up and gives him a warm little homily about how much God loves him and how, how God's going to bless him. And I'm glad that's all true. and Praise the Lord for it. But if you don't do what he says, there's another side to that story, isn't there? That side's not being told. And the people of America and the rest of the world are rapidly siding with the enemy against God. And God sits back for a while and he just looks and he just shakes his head. When Jesus got up on that, that uh, uh, Mount of Olives and he's looking out over Jerusalem, he, he just, he, he wept. He says, how often would I have gathered you as a hen doth gather her chickens under her wings? But you would not. They were all busy, all religious, all looking for just the right offering to bring on just the right day at just the right time to the right Levite group. But no heart in it for the Lord, no love for the Lord, no regard for His precious words. Within uh, 40 years, they were thrown out. That's almost 2,000 years ago. There's a lot to lose in this life. Fellowship with the Lord's precious. Verse 21. Boy, I tell you what, those people afraid of COVID, I wish they were all here listening tonight. Wouldn't it be great if God could get a hold of their ear and show them what real fear is? The Lord shall make the pestilence cleave unto thee until he hath consumed thee from off the land whither thou goest to possess it. That was God's land that he gave to those people as a blessing. That was a land that was promised to Abraham. Somebody's going to live in that land. Somebody's going to claim that property and raise up a glorious testimony to the Lord Jesus Christ one day. We, in prayer tonight, we're just talking about that, that glorious kingdom when the Lord Jesus returns and sets it up for a thousand years and then on into eternity. And there's going to be Jews there. And some of these folks will wish, man, I wish I'd have stayed faithful. 
I wish I'd have not turned that way or that way. I, I wish I'd have just followed the Lord. There's going to be a lot of Christians. There's going to be a millennial kingdom that there's going to be people ruling over cities. And there's going to be a bunch of other ones out there saying, boy, you know, I wish I'd have done something for the Lord while I could. Wish I'd have been a better witness. Wish I'd have given more to missions. Wish I'd have helped somebody more. Wish I'd have done something that God would have said, well done. You did what you could. Instead of give account of yourself. They're not going to reign in that time. Yes, sir. It's, it's uh, you, when you read through the Old Testament, every now and then God would bring a pestilence over the land and it was some kind of disease or some kind of uh, disfiguring thing or some kind of burning thing. Uh, you look at the, they call them the pestilences in Egypt. It's, it's just any kind of thing God brings over you to, to weigh you down with the weight of your guilt. And if it takes effect, maybe you get some relief from it. If, it, if you just get mad and shake your fist at God like those people in the tribulation, they're blaspheming God while God's pouring that on them to get them to repent. They're not going to repent. Hard-hearted, crazy people. I got, I got news for you. God ain't interested in your temper tantrum. What God's interested in is righteousness and truth in the inward parts. And when you get to that part, boy, you'd just be shocked at how gracious and kind and long-suffering and wonderful the Lord is to you. You can't hardly stand it anymore. It just, how can he be that good to me? I don't deserve that kind of treatment. He's good. Let me read verse uh, 22 again. And the Lord shall smite thee with a consumption and with a fever. I guess this is the explanation of that pestilence. And with an inflammation. Anybody know what one of the largest problems today causes almost every, uh, is at the root of almost every disease that you have today? Anybody know what it is? Inflammation. Isn't that weird? Maybe God's trying to talk to people and they're just not listening. Maybe nobody read that verse in the last 50 years. Maybe nobody took that serious. Listen, I'm, I'm not going to say you take an aspirin and it can overcome what God did. The fact that you're taking medicine to try and fix what only God can fix shows the folly of today's human beings, doesn't it? So anyway, he says, uh, with an inflammation, with an extreme burning, and with a sword, and with blasting, and with mildew. Imagine that, God, I I'm going to judge Connecticut. Everything you got is going to be covered with mildew. <laughs> isn't, isn't one of the greatest problems today is mold? Isn't that mildew? Yeah, it's one form of it anyway. You know something? That, that Bible ain't going to get out of date. The harder people fight against it, the more God's going to say, you thought you could beat me, didn't you? You thought you'd change that stuff and, and I'd be out of, out of luck? I've got news for you with the sword, with blasting, with mildew, and they shall pursue thee until thou perish. No matter where you run. You know what the problem's been with the Jews? Every place they run, they settle down there, think we're going to make a life here. And pretty soon, what, what comes against them? Everything. Persecution, problems. Everybody hates them. Why do people hate the Jews? Have you got any idea? Well, they're God's chosen people, but God says, if you don't do what I tell you to do, I'm going to throw you out there, and uh, you'll never stop running. You know what the, what's killing people? Fear. You know what the greatest object is today? Fear. You know what the devil uses mostly? Fear. You know what God says he gave you? Spirit of power. Sound mind, but it wasn't the power of fear. It's victory over fear. And we, we look at people... And, you see, half the Christians in the country, they're terrified. I'm not going to go to church. I might get COVID. Listen, if God wanted you to get COVID, you'd get it locked up in a cell all by yourself where nobody else was ever in there. Well, you think that thing needs somebody else to bring it to you? God can bring it to you. You can't protect yourself from what God's going to do. 
You just protect yourself from what God would do if you do wrong by doing right. And they shall pursue thee till thou perish. Verse 23, And thy heaven that is over thy head shall be brass, and the earth that is under thee shall be as iron. Did you ever hear any, I haven't heard anybody say this in years, but it used to be fairly common. Man, I feel like my prayers are just bouncing off the ceiling. Maybe there's something wrong in your life that, uh, that invitation every Sunday that you turn away from is trying to correct. Maybe something God trying to reach down from heaven and reach into your heart and stir something up to get you closer to him and open up those channels of heaven. By the way, the Holy Spirit's our, our connection, if you will, that, that, uh, that uh, anchor that's held within the veil. You grieve him. You get a foul of him. Those prayers ain't going very far. You're praying, Lord, I, I need some money and I need a blessing. The Holy Spirit says, Lord, that guy needs to be smacked around till he, till he straightens up. There's something wrong with him. Now, the Bible says the Holy Spirit inter intercedes with us with, with uh, prayers that can't be uttered. Yeah, groaning prayers can't be uttered. God, what God hears from us might not be what we think because he certainly knows what we have need of. Isn't this fun study? <laughs> Interesting. We, when we went through our study on Ezekiel, I, I kind of titled it, The God Nobody Knows. Because in Ezekiel, every time he turned around, he's, God's doing some weird thing to Ezekiel and to the people of Israel, and they wouldn't believe it was God doing it. Same thing with Jeremiah, same thing with Isaiah. God just doesn't do things the way men think he should. Amazing, he thinks he's God. The, uh, the Old Testament Jews, there's, there's some verses through Psalms and then through the Minor Prophets. And it, it uses a phrase that uh, God hiding his face from them. And I remember reading in our library back there, there's some books by some Jewish people and a couple of rabbis and stuff. And these rabbis every now and then would go to I'd bump elbows with a, with a Christian somewhere. And, and the, the rabbi, in a moment of uh, illumination from God, would ask the preacher, why is God hiding his face from us? Read your Bible, rabbi. You're supposed to be a teacher of Israel. Know not these things? What's wrong with you? God told you why he's going to hide his face from you. Because you won't listen to him. I bet Anna and Steve and every other parent has had come to a point where you have a kid kind of, Mommy, Mommy, Daddy, can we, can we, can we, can we, can we, can we? After the tenth time, what do you do with them? You just ignore them, Right? I already told you. Nope. Everybody think God's a good parent? Where do you think you learned how to do that from? <laughs> 24. The Lord shall make the rain of thy land powder and dust. <laughs> There's an expression for you. How's the blessings going? And that heavenly rainfall that God's going to open the windows of heaven and pour out is powder and dust. Not what we're looking for. Uh, Lord shall make the rain of, the, of thy land powder and dust from heaven. Shall it come down upon thee until thou be destroyed. God wants to give you blessings and goodness. He does. All we got to do is do what he wants can't bless a disobedient child. Bad teaching. You can't encourage him to do what's wrong. But the least bit of right gets a pat on the back. The least bit of right gets an encouragement. Amen. Anybody ever wonder why when somebody gets saved, the first day, week, maybe month, I prayed this and God answered my prayers and I did this and God answered my prayers and I did this and even the little kids down there, the Sunday school teachers will talk about uh, 
well, the so-and-so's got this problem in their family or in their house or, you know, with their dog or cat or whatever. And they'll pray for it. Next thing you know, the kid, boy, and God did this. And you know why? He likes you talking to him. He likes you trusting him. And he gives you those little things to show you, I can do it. Just don't give up asking. Of course, we get a little bit older and we think we can do it now. And then when God doesn't do it, we take it as sort of a personal affront that God didn't do what I want him to do. We ought to be old enough as we get older to realize God's way smarter than we are. If he didn't do it, he had a pretty good reason for it. And maybe he'll tell us, maybe he won't. You know, we'll know. Further along, we'll understand why. Those songs, man, they mean something, don't they? You can learn some, some reality from those songs. In verse... Uh, 20, uh, 25, the Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies. Not every victory is going to be yours. Thou shalt go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them. Well, we read before that if you do right, they're going to flee before you. And shall be removed unto all the kingdoms of the earth. That's where Israel is right this minute. That bunch that's in Israel, I think it's got part of the promises of God. I think they're they're not altogether uh, out of the will of God and coming back there. But they are not anywhere near where they've, they're coming back under conviction that Jesus w wants them back in Jerusalem. They're simply coming back for some other reason. During that tribulation period, when that's over, the Gentiles will carry him back. The nations will protect him and carry him back. God will send out hunters and fishers and bring him back there. That's the wave where they come back for the blessing. And it's coming. And God says, you're coming back in belief. Watch the blessings pour out. Watch the plowman, uh, the reaper overtake the plowman. And watch those rains, the earlier and the latter rains come in season. And uh, then the windows of heaven open up. But it's because of Israel's obedience. And they've got the right king on the throne. Thou shalt be removed from all the kingdoms of the earth. Verse 26, And thy carcass shall be meat unto the fowls of the air and unto the beast of the earth. No man shall fray them away. That fray is to chase, disperse them. You're not going to be able to chase that stuff out. You're going to have a plague of animals and pestilences and stuff you can't do anything about. In verse 27, The Lord will smite thee with the blotch, a botch of Egypt, and with the emeralds, <laughs> you might remember what those emeralds are. If you put an H in it, you got it. Yeah. That's why when those Philistines were struck with them, they whoa! <laughs> uh, the other terminology developed from that later on. I think it was a Philistine expedient <laughs> that <laughs> came up out of that. But at any rate, all those things there, God says, you're pretty comfortable and satisfied right now. You won't believe how miserable your life can be if you don't do what I tell you to do. We just take it for granted that everything's going to be okay. You better do what God, what God wants. Hey, but preacher, that's Israel. God's telling Israel what he wanted. I mean, they're not doing it to earn their salvation. We're delivered into the land. Just saying, folks. Verse 27, the Lord will smite thee with the bot, uh, botch of Egypt and with the emeralds and with the scab and with the itch whereof thou canst not be healed. Imagine having all that stuff and there's no fix for it. There's no balm of Gilead, to, no salve that can cool that, soothe that, fix it up. Nobody to go to. Maybe those uh, 144,000 in the tribulation going to have some answers for these guys because there's still Jews wandering around the earth. And the Lord will smite thee with madness and blindness and astonishment of heart. We're going to end on that verse. That's an awful place to end. But that's the, that's the man that won't obey God. His last end is madness, blindness, and astonishment of heart. You know what the Bible characterizes the last days of over in the book of Luke? In the last days, men's hearts will be failing them for fears for the things coming upon the earth. The nations roaring in perplexity. 
No way out. No answer. Can't figure out a thing. What do we do? Madness. I think we're there. I think we're there. It only begs the question.